Well, life requires energy to carry on, so let's have a look at energy relationships in the biosphere. Uh, to understand energy, you need to understand that energy is basically transmitted or propagated as a wave. And so here's a diagram that shows the different types of waves of energy that we might experience here on Earth. And we start at this end with very, very long waves, and at this other end with very, very short waves and everything in between. So longer waves include things like radio transmissions and cell phones. Here are microwaves that you find in your microwave cooker. And what's important for us, of course, is visible light. So here's the section of the spectrum where you and I can actually see things. So we can't see radio waves or microwaves, but we can see the colors of the spectrum. Just below it, we have infrared or heat waves, which you sometimes see on, on heat lamps that keep food warm in kitchens. And, and up here we have ultraviolet, which you can't see, but you need sunglasses to block, otherwise you might get skin cancer. Higher than that we have x-rays, which uh, are very handy to see what's inside of our bodies, but can be damaging to our health. And gamma rays, which are the most intense uh, waves at all, very, very short wavelengths, and they can do a, quite a bit of damage if you get exposed to these gamma waves. Uh, the electromagnetic wave is rather interesting in that it's made up of, as the name suggests, an electric field shown here in orange and a magnetic field shown in blue. And notice that the two fields are 90 degrees uh, separated from each other. In other words, in this diagram, the electric field is running vertically and the magnetic field is running horizontally. What this means then is an electromagnetic wave is self-propagating. It does not need a medium to travel through. For example, sound requires air to travel through. It needs a medium, but an electromagnetic wave does not. These things can travel completely through the vacuum of space and arrive here at Earth. Insulation and the angle of inclination. So let's have a look at this. First off, the word insulation. Look at this very carefully. That is an O. It comes from the word sol which means sun, okay? So I don't mean insulation, you know, the foam inside the walls of your house to keep the heat in. I mean insolation. Check that spelling very carefully. Angle of inclination. As it turns out, uh, the Earth is tilted at an angle of about 23.5 degrees. And as we travel around the sun in our yearly orbit, this angle means certain parts of the Earth get more sunlight than others at different times of the year. For example, if we look at us, on June the 21st, we are tilted towards the sun at an angle of 23 and a half degrees, and so the northern hemisphere is getting a bit more solar exposure on June the 21st. This is, in fact, the longest day of the year. And that's when the Tropic of Cancer, that's the northern tropic right here, lines up directly with the sun. Now contrast that with the other half of the year, for example, on December the 21st, this is the longest night for us in North America, and it's the shortest day. And what's happening here now is the lower tropic, the Tropic of Capricorn, which is 23 and a half degrees below the equator, it now lines up directly with the sun. So the countries in the southern half of the planet are getting much more insulation than we are in the northern planet. Now, of course, on March the 21st and September the 23rd. This is where we kind of have the 50-50. This is where what we call the equinox, where the days and nights are pretty much the same. So as we rotate the sun on our annual orbit, we have different portions of the planet, north and south, getting slightly different amounts of solar insulation, which of course changes their heat. Because you see, the angle of incidence that the light hits you has a big effect upon how warm you get. So if you're right here, on this part of the planet and you're getting incoming solar radiation aimed directly above you, this is the most intense radiation that you can get. This is going to be the hottest uh, you can imagine. Whereas if you're way up north, looking at the curvature of the planet here, we see that the same amount of radiation, so if we look at the size of this radiation and the size of this one, we see that they're the same. But over here in the north, they're spread out over a much larger surface area and so the intensity is a lot less. Well, that means there's a lot less sunlight, quite frankly, a lot less energy for plants to grow and animals to live. Uh, it's going to be different up there. And of course, it's generally going to be cooler. So what that means is, if you look at the overall planet Earth, and, and I think we pretty much all knew this, that we are not evenly heated. In fact, we are unevenly heated. It's pretty darn obvious that located here at the equator, we receive a tremendous amount of, uh, of heat. Whereas as you get further away from the equator, of course, it's cooler and cooler. Now, this big difference in temperature is what causes things like the ocean currents to move and the winds to move around the planet because, of course, we don't have an equal input of energy. Some places are hotter, some places are cooler. 
The atmosphere, of course, plays a big role in this. It actually acts as a, an absorbing cushion and absorbs a tremendous amount of the energy that does come into us from outer space. And as it turns out, that, that's actually a good thing. Uh, once again, here in the center, we have the visible light spectrum that you and I can see. And then over here, we have the gammas and x-rays, the short waves, and here we have the long waves that we don't see. But notice that the, the atmosphere absorbs uh, quite a lot of this radiation. That's good because, for example, if we were exposed to these gamma rays or x-rays, we would uh, fairly shortly uh, develop cancer. And we know that people who get sunburnt, for example, uh, may tend to develop cancer later on in life. So it's a good thing we have a nice thick atmosphere that protects us um, because we do need shelter from that intense radiation. Another word we want to introduce to you is this one, albedo. This word means reflection by the lithosphere. Now, you might have already figured this one out, but if you look at this diagram here, you can see that a snow-covered surface is nice and white and reflective. As a matter of fact, sometimes when you're out skiing, you usually have to wear goggles to shield yourself from the intense reflection coming off of the snow. Well, what that means, as you can see right here, is that if you've got a high albedo or a high reflectivity, an awful lot of the sun's radiation is going to bounce right off, and you're not going to absorb much. Well, if you're not going to absorb that radiation, if you're not going to absorb that energy, then that means that there's less energy for things to grow and develop. So albedo has a huge effect upon who can live and who can live where on both the lithosphere, the, the solid part of the Earth, and the hydrosphere. Here's a map of the Earth showing, relatively speaking, uh, how much re reflectivity there is in certain places. And you can see that some places reflect an awful lot of heat. Notice, for example, up here in northern Canada and northern Asia, look how much heat we reflect there. And of course, you're wondering why it's cold. There's your explanation. Now, the Sahara Desert reflects a lot of heat as well, that's true, but of course, since they're located in the tropics, they get so much bombardment of radiation that even though they're reflecting a lot, it's still pretty darn hot there. So let's talk about the greenhouse effect because this is going to be around to, in, in later topics here. If we look at a picture of a greenhouse, here's what's going on here. Anybody who's been inside of a greenhouse knows that it's warmer inside the greenhouse than it is outside. Here's what's happening. The sun radiates rather short waves of radiation and they can go straight through glass. In other words, glass is transparent, so the light goes right through. But inside the greenhouse, this radiation strikes various objects and it gets re-radiated or reflected as much longer longer waves. Now these longer waves, some of them can get out, but a lot of these waves bounce off the glass. In other words, they can't penetrate through the glass because their wavelength is longer, and they affect get they, they get reflected right back into the greenhouse. Well, what that does, of course, is that raises the temperature inside the greenhouse by these reflected waves of longer radiation. The Earth has a natural greenhouse effect too. So just like a greenhouse, solar radiation comes in, as you see right here, strikes the Earth, and is re-radiated as heat. And a lot of it gets reflected. Now, some gets radiated, that's true, but a lot gets reflected in. In other words, a lot of what keeps our planet as warm as it is, is the natural greenhouse effect that we have due to our atmosphere acting rather like a greenhouse. What we're going to concern ourselves with in this unit is what's called the human-enhanced greenhouse effect. Our question that we're going to ask is, because of these gases, CO2, methane, and N2O that we have added to the atmosphere, have we made the greenhouse effect even stronger than it naturally is, causing the Earth to retain even more heat than it naturally does by itself? Well, that leads us to this topic here called the net radiation budget, which means can we account for or can we tally up what happens to the energy that comes in? So if we have 100% of the solar radiation coming into the Earth, what happens to it? Well, we can see here that about 6% of it is reflected right off the atmosphere, off the tops of clouds, etc. is another 20%. Uh, some is reflected off the surface of the Earth. So we get various forms of albedo which reflect this, this, sol this solar energy off various surfaces in the atmosphere and on Earth. Some of it is absorbed by the atmosphere, some is absorbed by clouds. Of course, an awful lot is absorbed by land, 51%. And, of course, that warms up the land. Now, of the material, that the energy that is absorbed by the land, we see that quite a bit of it is re-radiated back out into space. And how much depends, frankly, on how much cloud cover you have. So you should know that if you live here in Canada, that if it's wintertime, for example, and we have a cold day followed by a cold night, and there's no clouds that night, it's going to be very, very cold the next morning. And you're probably going to be scraping off your windshield because a lot of that heat's going to escape because there were no clouds to reflect it back down into the Earth again. So what this results is, is if you look at the Earth, here's the equator. 
right in the middle of the Earth, and here's the South Pole, and there's the North Pole. And what you may notice is that at the uh, at the uh, equator areas or the tropical areas, you can see that there's a, an excess amount of heat that we're absorbing that we sort of can't get rid of. Uh, but at the poles, we have a, sh a shortfall of heat uh, where we're losing heat from the poles, and we're so I mean on balance you might say it looks like we balance, but again it's not equal. Certain parts of the planet have an excess of heat, other parts of the planet sort of have a shortage of heat. And it's that difference, of course, which is going to make a lot of things happen.